Great. So welcome everyone to the first lecture of the series Climate Controversies in Southeast Asia. The lecture series is organized by the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at Bonn University in cooperation with the um, Stiftung Asienhaus, the Philippine Bureau, and with Fridays for Future Hochschulgruppe Bonn and Fridays for Future Köln. Um, my name is Oliver Pai, I'm from the Department of Southeast Asian Studies and I'll be moderating this first session. I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see the screen? Son, can you see my screen? Yes, I can, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So as you can see, um, this is the, the series. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of, uh, of speakers, both cutting edge scientists and cutting edge activists, uh, mainly from the region, but also experts who work on Southeast Asia. And they'll be speaking to three interrelated um, themes, the first of which will be the impact of climate change on Southeast Asia. The second theme is um, the causes of, of climate change in Southeast Asia. And the third theme is climate justice movements in Southeast Asia, i.e. what to do about it all. Uh, so as you can see, um, the series is not purely academic. Um, the situation is dire. Action is urgently needed, uh, not just because of the climate change denialist in the White House, um, but um, uh, also generally. Um, so we're particularly happy, actually, that um, Fridays for Future is involved in this series, but is also taking a lead globally in the struggle for climate justice. And we hope that this series will be a small, give a small contribution to um, developing a truly global movement for effective climate um, act, action on climate and for climate justice in general. Um, the, the poster that you can see on the left, um, if anyone wants to have it, just send me an email. It's um, produced by a, a great graphic designer, um, Neti Wichian Sen from Thailand. Um, and uh, yeah. So thank you very much for that as well. So kicking off the series today, we have Professor Philip Hirsch. And we're very glad to welcome him here today because Professor Hirsch is an eminent scholar on all things to do with the environment and with development in Southeast Asia. He's a Professor Emeritus uh, of human geography at the University of Sydney and has a special focus on mainland Southeast Asia and the Mekong. Um, he has written a number of great books that have been widely read in the academic circles. Um, I remember reading his work as a PhD student many years ago. Um, and most recently, he's um, edited the Handbook of the Environment in Southeast Asia and the Mekong socio-legal approach to river basin management. So get those for your library. Um, so thanks very much um, for being with us tonight, Phil, especially as tonight in your case is 10 p.m. or it's after 10 p.m. now, isn't it? So that's very much appreciated. Um, you'll have about 30 minutes for the lecture. And then we'll have another half an hour or so for questions, for discussion, um, before you wrap up at the end. So I'll hand over to you now, Phil. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Um, I'm just sharing my screen uh, to begin with. Uh, is that all set up okay? okay. Yep. Okay. okay. Good. 
So now uh, my video is off, but that's that's okay. It's it's the PowerPoint to focus on. Well, thank you, Oliver. It's, it's really an honor uh, to be invited by you and your uh, center and program to uh, kick off this series. It uh, looks like an extraordinarily interesting uh, set of presentations on multiple dimensions and topics in, in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm going to give something of an overview uh, today in the half hour I have uh, of climate change, but situating it within the wider question of environmental controversies and how we think about them in Southeast Asia. I'm not going to give a lot of uh, facts and figures about uh, climate change and uh, its, its, its impacts, uh, but rather uh, sketch out some of the uh, key, uh, key issues. And in particular, to um, think about how we uh, conceptualize them as controversies, in other words, uh, what makes them uh, political. And in order to do that, I'm going to broadly use uh, political ecology as a perspective in understanding climate change controversies as they're situated uh, with regard to uh, other ways of thinking about the, uh, the, the environment. Um, I guess a lot of those in the audience will already be familiar with uh, the idea of political, political ecology, but for those who are, are newer to it, it's a, it's a big field. It's a field that's been around for 30, uh, 40 years. Um, and one of the uh, most prolific authors in the field, Raymond Bryant, uh, who wrote a book in the 1980s called Third World Political Ecology, and more recently has uh, produced a handbook of political ecology, which is really like, like a kind of encyclopedia uh, of, of, on the topic, uh, defined in 1998 a political ecology as a political dynamic surrounding the material and discursive struggles over the environment. So with that definition, uh, I'm looking at political ecology as a way of understanding climate change uh, controversies as an approach that treats environmental questions as inherently uh, political questions, not just technical questions. Uh, and in treating uh, environment and climate change as inherently political, uh, it uh, relates to, first of all, who gets what at whose expense from environmental goods and environmental uh, bads, what you might call the geo-distributional issues, both geographical distribution, for example, if you build a, a dam in one place, uh, it affects people in one place and those who benefit from the power, water and so on, maybe somewhere else. So there's uneven distribution and there's a politics in that. But there's also a societal distribution, whether we talk about gender, whether we talk about uh, the way the rich and the poor uh, experience environment uh, differently and uh, benefit uh, differentially from uh, projects that uh, cause such environmental change. Uh, it's also, uh, relates to procedural questions. Who makes decisions on whose behalf? Who makes environmental decisions? How is power distributed uh, to make uh, decisions? Uh, and that's uh, something else which is, of course, uh, highly relevant to climate change in Southeast Asia and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but it also relates to how we frame uh, environmental questions uh, as climate change questions or perhaps as something else um, and how they're contested uh, discursively, how they're uh, represented in the, in, the, in the public arena. So we can broadly think about uh, uh, a political ecology approach as dealing with distributional issues, procedural issues, and representational, representational issues, uh, which, which make them uh, political. Let me turn to uh, the way we apply it then to uh, perspectives on climate change controversies in, in the region. As you can see from the map here, we're, we're looking at a um, uh, a region which I guess most in the audience will be familiar with, but again, for those who are uh, coming with more knowledge of climate change and less knowledge of the region, we're looking at uh, a region uh, that is politically known as ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and it includes what's sometimes referred to as maritime and mainland Southeast Asia. And because of the uh, very diverse geographies of the region, the ways in which climate change uh, is affecting and will affect the region also, is specific to different parts of it. One uh, immediately noticeable point, of course, is that it's a, a region with exceptionally 
uh, big exposure to a coastal uh, impacts and what from what we know about sea level rise, but also uh, the impacts of uh, changing weather patterns, uh, storms, and, and and so on. This makes it a particularly important issue in, in the Philippines, in uh, in Vietnam, as we have seen on our news screens in the last few days with the uh, extreme uh, cyclone that uh, hit the Philippines, has uh, uh, also uh, devastated the Vietnam coast, and in fact is causing rain from right out uh, right outside my door here in in, in northern Thailand. Um, so uh, we can uh, look at different uh, parts of the region, but we can also look at uh, political ecology uh, in terms of impacts uh, of the, the problem itself, of the, of the uh, physical manifestations of uh, what climate change is doing, uh, not only the weather patterns, but the sea level rise uh, and, and so on. Um, we can also look at the implications of the responses to climate change. In other words, and I'll be talking about this in more detail, we can look at um, the kinds of programs that have been brought in to deal with climate change, to mitigate or adapt to climate uh, change, and the kinds of impacts and controversies that they engender. Uh, I see that in your uh, lecture series, you've got uh, some lectures devoted specifically to, to these. Uh, and then we can also look, as I said, at the way in which we frame uh, environmental issues as climate change or as, as, as something else. And uh, to be a bit provocative, I'm going to uh, finish off the lecture. In the last section of the lecture, I'm going to uh, suggest that uh, climate change can sometimes be seen as a kind of anti-politics in Southeast Asia. And I'll explain what I mean by that uh, as, we, as we go. So if we see this way of framing climate change uh, in political ecology terms, this is also a kind of outline for the, for the remainder of, of the talk, starting by looking at the impacts in Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, here's an image of uh, a mega, a monster uh, typhoon or cyclone, hurricane that uh, hit the Philippines in uh, at the end of October, just three days ago, and has moved steadily uh, westward. Uh, and uh, if we're looking at uh, the nature of the problem of climate change in Southeast Asia, of course, uh, the, the, the first and foremost uh, impact is on, on the climate itself. And what does that mean then in, in material terms? Well, very briefly, uh, in the Mekong region, mainly Southeast Asia, the part of the region I'm most familiar with, uh, uh, most projections uh, suggest an intensification of wet and dry seasons. We're talking here about a highly monsoonal climate, that is, there's a big uh, extreme difference in rainfall already between uh, wet and dry seasons, and the uh, projections of climate change is that those are going to intensify, uh, which, which have implications then for uh, in more intense uh, floods and, uh, and droughts. Uh, we also see uh, more storm frequency and intensity. If we look at the recent uh, uh, typhoons in the uh, South China Sea in the, Philipp the Philippines and then uh, Vietnam, we can see that uh, over the last uh, decade, there have been more uh, of these really high intensity uh, events than there have had been in the previous 50, uh, 50 years. So uh, the uh, high impact, uh, short duration uh, events have always happened, but they're happening uh, more often and they're happening with greater intensity and, uh, and impact. Um, and then we have what we might call the slow onset uh, impacts of climate change, uh, first and foremost of which is uh, sea level rise uh, of the order of uh, anything from a few millimeters to uh, a couple of centimeters a year, depending on the way you are in the uh, in the region um, that comes uh, with the warming of the oceans, but also with warming of air, we see then uh, the impacts uh, coming in terms of uh, the spread of diseases from uh, uh, some areas to, uh, uh, to others. So if we look at the uh, impacts of these climate changes, uh, Large areas in Southeast Asia are low-lying coastal areas, particularly the delta. You'll be hearing next week from uh, Dr. Leanne Tuan about the uh, Mekong Delta, uh, 
uh, but you've got the Mekong Delta, the uh, Red River Delta, uh, the uh, Chao Phraya Delta, Irrawaddy Delta, uh, and then many smaller deltas in Indonesia and the Philippines, um, which are highly important for agriculture, but it's also where uh, millions of people live. And uh, it's also where the large uh, mega cities are located, Bangkok, Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, only just above sea level. Some areas are already below sea level, and most of those cities uh, are no more than one meter above sea level as, as, as it is. Um, so we're looking at uh, potentially a huge impacts on, uh, on settlement. Uh, but also then along uh, coastal areas, along coastlines and in, this, in, in the ocean itself with uh, the rising water temperatures, ocean water temperatures, we have problems of coral bleaching, which have been uh, talked about more famously in Australia with the uh, impact on the Great Barrier Reef, but we also see that in, in the region. And then the spread of uh, diseases, uh, diseases, dengue fever is one of the uh, biggest concerns in the region at the, uh, at the moment. Uh, if we look at experience to date on, on these kinds of uh, in, uh, changes and it impacts, one of the really challenging things is to uh, discern climate change from weather variability. Weather is, is, is and always has been uh, variable. So uh, sorting out what is longer term trends in climate change from weather variability can in fact uh, be a political issue in, it, in, in its own right. It's subject to measurement, it's also subject to perceptions, and those perceptions are governed by the way it's talked about in the media, but also by uh, issues such as where people choose to live. Uh, there are many areas that are more susceptible to climate change, not only because the climate is changing, but because uh, people are living in areas that uh, are, uh, are vulnerable in, in, in their own right. So, one of the uh, questions, one of the political questions uh, that uh, is controversial in looking at climate change is how we explain impacts in terms of climate change versus other uh, causes. Uh, in 2011, uh, large areas of central Thailand and the capital Bangkok were underwater for months and caused in monetary terms, one of the biggest National, uh, natural disasters anywhere of all time, uh, but also uh, several hundred lives were lost and uh, people's uh, lives were, were affected over a uh, period of time. The government uh, sort of bent over backwards to try to explain this in terms of the unfortunate impact of climate change, but this also then served as a deflection against uh, uh, some other uh, causes, for example, building in the wrong places, for example, managing upstream dams in, in ways that uh, hadn't taken account of the likelihood and the, and the projections that the meteorologists were, uh, were warning about uh, ahead of time. So in this case, we can see climate change used to deflect, uh, deflect blame. A more recent and uh, more dramatic and, and, and tragic uh, event uh, two years ago in July, 2018 was the uh, collapse of a dam that was under construction, nearing completion. The reservoir had already been uh, more than half filled. This is a dam in southern Laos, uh, the Sepian Senam Noi Dam in, in, in southern Laos. Um, and again, the early uh, explanation of this dam collapse from the dam owners uh, was that it was a very unfortunate result of extreme rain rainfall conditions that was linked to uh, climate change, and uh, I, this was a way of uh, diffusing, de deflecting blame uh, from poor engineering that led to the uh, dam collapse. At least 70 people were killed, 7,000 people uh, were made homeless, are still homeless, are still living in, uh, in uh, very bad conditions. Uh, so uh, we can see climate change here uh, as certainly contributing to uh, the uh, event that led to the dam collapse, but putting the blame on climate change is another question, controversial. Uh, if we look at the Mekong River itself in 2019, and even more extremely this year in 2020, uh, the flows have been the lowest uh, ever during the wet season. Um, the Great Lake in Cambodia, which normally uh, expands by five times and rises nine meters in uh, height uh, 
as a result of the natural flood and is a source of the uh, most uh, fertile fishery anywhere in the world, freshwater fishery anywhere in the world, it simply didn't, didn't materialize uh, uh, this, uh, this year. Um, and part of the reason was uh, because of the holding back of water uh, by upstream dams in China and possibly in, in Laos, part of the reason was lower than normal rainfall. So we get the controversy over how you uh, explain uh, environmental uh, issues uh, that have, have multiple sources. Um, even something as seemingly innocuous as plastic bags. Uh, I, this is just an anecdotal, but when I cycle along to the local market near where I live in Chiang Mai, and I uh, ask people uh, to put uh, goods in a, anything other than a plastic bag, usually I get a, a sort of smile and say, oh, you're, you're, you're afraid of climate change, are you? So there's a tendency for everything to come under the uh, issue of uh, climate change. And here we see a little image from the uh, Thailand Green greenhouse gas management organization that make a similar uh, link asking people to reduce their plastic bag use in order not to solve the problem of ocean waste or uh, garbage on the streets but to reduce global warming so climate change becomes something of a catch-all um, which which then brings us to another sort of highly controversial aspect of climate change is how you are, I not only explain uh, the phenomena that we see but also where blame lies uh, and where responsibility is, uh, is identified. Uh, climate change is sometimes, particularly in Southeast Asia, which of course is a rapidly growing uh, region economically and where emissions are growing, but nevertheless, Southeast Asia historically has not been uh, one of the major regions of the world uh, that has contributed to greenhouse gas emissions. And as a result, climate change is sometimes seen as externally caused. As a result, it can be uh, treated as an externalized uh, problem, again, to deflect uh, the, uh, the blame or the explanation of causes that may be uh, more uh, local. How's climate change then dealt with in a region like Southeast Asia? Uh, well, often it's discussed either in terms of adaptation as an externalized problem. Uh, it's seen as something which uh, no amount of uh, change in energy uses and so on is really going to make a difference at the uh, global level for some time at least and therefore the only thing is to adapt. But it's also a, uh, an area for uh, mitigation programs, that is to uh, uh, find ways to uh, reduce Southeast Asia's footprint in, in climate change uh, by bringing in programs that uh, will uh, help to mitigate at a global level. Uh, some of those programs are around uh, forests because deforestation in the region uh, has been rapid in Indonesia, in Thailand, more recently in Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, and in Laos, we've seen a, a heavy loss of forests and therefore uh, uh, an increase in release of carbon into the atmosphere, which even though it's at a global level, uh, uh, nothing like the emissions that we find from uh, historic fossil fuel use in North America, Europe, and Australia, for example, it's still uh, it's part of the contributor. Uh, and so this raises uh, questions around glo uh, global climate governance and uh, nego negotiations about who bears historic responsibility, who continues to pollute the most, and who is therefore best able to mitigate uh, the uh, existing emissions. Uh, one way in which uh, this has been uh, done at a global level uh, as a global governance response is uh, through uh, pa various payment schemes where those countries uh, that historically have been and continue to be the largest uh, emitters uh, help poorer countries or help regions such as Southeast Asia uh, to reduce their impact uh, by paying for mitigation and the secondary benefit to those uh, countries, the paying countries, can in effect buy carbon credits and uh, put those against their own continuing emissions, which itself is highly controversial. We'll be hearing a lot, I'm sure, from Chris Lang and from others uh, later on about these programs. So I won't, I, I won't go into any detail, but just to mention, for example, the uh, uh, 
best known program, the Red Plus, the reduced emissions from deforestation and uh, deg degradation, uh, which involves climate change financing from wealthier countries and uh, international institutions for avoided forest loss or degradation, how you measure avoidance and so on, uh, how you determine those carbon credits is, 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 is uh, much more detailed than it I can go into here. Another example, which is highly controversial in the region, is something called the Clean Development Mechanism, uh, which involves uh, financing, again, from uh, countries that want to buy carbon credits uh, for projects that are seen uh, to avoid uh, the need for extra emissions. And they're based on the idea that uh, countries uh, that are lower or middle income countries uh, need to and will continue to expand their economies, uh, but they, they might be helped to do so by investing in projects that have lower carbon uh, emissions, lower climate uh, change impacts uh, than, uh, for example, coal-fired power stations and so on. And one of the most uh, favored type projects for CDM or climate uh, development mechanism projects in Southeast Asia has been climate ch change financing for hydropower, uh, providing carbon credits uh, uh, here. There's been dozens of dams, particularly in Vietnam, but some in Laos, such as the one you see here, the uh, Namalik 1-2 hydropower project. I put that up as a uh, just a an example of a project which I've had some involvement in, in researching in terms of the uh, impacts. And these projects are in effect subsidized by these carbon credits. Uh, here you see uh, the form that is a certification that this uh, project will indeed uh, lead to uh, an additional uh, avoidance of the need to uh, invest in coal or another type of energy project. But given that uh, dams themselves have immense impacts on rivers, on people's livelihoods uh, and environmental impacts in their, in their own right, uh, the swapping of uh, climate change impacts for these kinds of impacts is, is one of the controversies that makes these mitigation uh, schemes uh, so, so controversial. Um, so this also then brings us back to the question of how we frame uh, environmental issues as either climate issues or as, as, as something else. And the way in which I uh, get into this is through the notion of anti-politics. Anti-politics is a, a term that's associated most often with uh, an anthropologist, uh, James Ferguson, who wrote about a book uh, back in the 1990s called The Anti-Politics Machine. And he wasn't talking about climate change, of course, he was talking about development. And the development was seen as anti-politics because it did a number of things, uh, including what Ferguson called rendering technical. It took issues that were uh, inherently political and rendered them technical uh, as anti-political, as uh, as depoliticizing. I see anti-politics, particularly in the context of climate change in the region, as diffusing of uh, controversy, deflecting controversy, putting it on someone else, or distancing it, putting it somewhere else. Uh, so it can be the casting of phenomena or projects in ways that strip them of dimensions of power, uh, that place them in a realm that denies identification of culprits in relation to victims, and that uh, negates the proximity of cause and effect, that in other words, distances themselves, and Climate change does all this. Again, just another quick an anecdote, if I may. Um, about uh, 10 years ago, I was uh, asked uh, by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research to help set up a project in Laos that looked at the fisheries impacts, the fisheries livelihood impacts of hydropower, which is a very direct way of getting at a highly controversial issue in, uh, in Laos. And it, even, even then, it was uh, something that was quite a delicate issue to uh, to work with. I was working with a government institution, the recently established water resource and uh, uh, environment research organization, um, and the director of that took me nervously along to uh, his minister, uh, who listened 
for about two minutes to our proposal for such a project. And she turned to me and said, well, I think you'd better study climate change. And this was really a, a polite or more direct way of uh, suggesting that uh, we should study something that's quite unpolitical in, in the context of uh, what was going on in rivers in, uh, in uh, Laos. Uh, so we, we got around it, unlike this poor fish in the dam, we got around it and, and set up the project framed in somewhat different terms. Uh, so to finish off, I'd like to then uh, just suggest three ways in which we can understand climate change, not as non-political, but as anti-politics in the sense that it's framed as if it were uh, not political. In fact, such a framing is a highly political act in its own right. Uh, but it does this by, by, as I said, distancing the cause, the effects, and the culprits uh, from the time and place of an environmental injustice. So, for example, if we look at dams, it, dams uh, can uh, be seen to have very immediate effects. Uh, they flood areas of rice land, they flood communities, they lead to downstream impacts on fisheries, and so on. Uh, climate change is a much safer space to conduct research. Uh, as the minister suggested uh, to me, uh, because we're not really looking at any culprits who can be identified readily in, uh, in, in, in country. It's, uh, it's a global uh, generalized uh, phenomenon. Um, I talked about the uh, Sipi and Sinanoi dam collapse. Here's a picture of uh, people who spent days on the roofs of their houses after the uh, dam released half a billion cubic meters of water all in one go in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, affecting so many. Uh, the government newspapers uh, reported uh, a couple of years later that in 2018 Laos suffered its most costly floods in a decade. Heavy rains from two tropical cyclones affected the country and a saddle dam in Athapro province collapsed, uh, the Sipi and Sinan Noi province, uh, uh, the dam, uh, causing flash floods. Uh, the floods impacted more than 600,000 citizens, resulting in 64 deaths. So here the the dam collapse was roped into this wider set of uh, uh, weather-related events, which in turn are related back uh, in the public mind to climate change. Another way then, as I said, is, is, is that way uh, solutions to environmental problems are rendered technical, uh, even when uh, they're quite clearly and controversially selective and therefore political in their uh, local and societal effects in their transboundary impacts. Uh, Last year in July, the Chinese embassy uh, released uh, this uh, frequent floods and droughts in the Mekong Basin of the effect of global climate change. The construction of Cascade Reservoirs on the Lanchang River is an effective measure against climate change. The Cascade hydropower stations which discharge water in the dry season and store water in the wet season are able to adjust the water level of the Lanchang Mekong River, rendered technical. Uh, the, uh, the, the problem of drought and floods is solved technically. Uh, the uh, climate change and not dams is, is uh, seen as the controversy. Um, and then also there's the way in which uh, climate change captures the space of public discourse on many environmental issues in a way that displaces more immediate and also more local approximate problems and their uh, solutions. Uh, in a, an interesting article uh, in the journal uh, uh, One Earth, uh, uh, Western Derby, I suggest that uh, in the Mekong region, climate change has become the dominant narrative at the expense of the attention we need to give to the uh, starvation of sediment as uh, dams in particular, but also in other infrastructure projects uh, trap uh, sediment. Uh, that also take attention away from groundwater extra extraction, from uh, the changed hydrology of the river as a result of impoundment by reservoirs, a land cover change, and so on. So it steals, it steals the limelight, if you, if, if you like. So finally, to uh, raise some questions, and these might be questions to bear in mind, uh, not only for the longer term, but also more immediately for the remainder of this uh, uh, lecture series, uh, there's a question of, of who is responsible uh, for climate change in, uh, in, in, in the first place, uh, who suffers the impacts of, of, of climate change? Uh, in other words, is this a generalized uh, uh, issue or is it something which we need to think of in terms of political ecology of, of uh, victims, but also culprits? Uh, 
uh, climate change mitigation programs such as Red Plus and uh, the Clean Development Mechanism, uh, progressive or regressive in terms of environmental justice? Answering this question might also require that we look at the scale of uh, environmental justice. What might seem like a good idea at a global level can have very uh, unjust or aggressive uh, impacts at a more local level. And that brings us into the question of what scales of impact and response are implied by uh, climate change. Um, we think of climate change rightly as a global problem, but it also has very localized uh, impacts, not only because the climate is different in different parts of the world, but also because the impacts intersect with other environmental and developmental uh, events and processes. Uh, how does climate change then intersect with other environmental issues, whether it's deforestation or uh, displacement by dams and, uh, and so on? And finally, uh, how does the way we talk about and frame climate change explain impacts and assign responsibility? And with that, I'll leave it to uh, the time we have remaining for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Phil, uh, introduction. I think it offers a, a nice framework for the whole series so we can refer back to some of these uh, very pertinent questions um, as we as we go you know more into detail. Uh, so I, I like the way you you know you connect climate change to um, the political ecology of Southeast Asia in general and, uh, and how you, you examine how it intersects with other environmental problems. And um, Phil gave us three points to, to you know to help us think about. It, the, the nature of the problem, the controversies about how it impacts different people in different ways, and the the discussion or the controversies around who is responsible for it and the explanation for these uh, problems. Then uh, the contro controversies around mitigation projects, for example, uh, carbon credits or dams, and thirdly the controversies around discourses and the way discourses are dis constructed to depoliticize to render technical um, the issue of climate change. And um, of course, this is something we uh, will be looking into as the series goes on, um, because of course, we, we will see that climate change is not just a technical issue, but is very, very closely connected to questions of, of power, democracy, class, um, struggle, um, and so that's I think very, very, very useful uh, introduction and framework for, for everyone. Um, okay, so let's get stuck into the discussion. Um, you have the opportunity to ask questions, but you can also make comments. Um, I think some of the students have prepared some questions if, uh, based on their readings so far. If, if that makes sense, you can ask them. If someone doesn't want to, if, um, say it themselves, they can put their question into the chat. And you might have to raise your hand uh, in the technical way because I can't see everyone at once because there are too many people in the in this session. Who wants to start? And there are no stupid questions. You can start with very basic questions, no problem. Yeah, Michael. All right. Um, hi, Phil. Good to see you. Um, it was very interesting. Your your talk is it was very uh, um, very much a good introduction into the problem of climate change in the whole region. Um, so I have two questions, one Laos question and one more general one. Um, so about Laos, um, the argument is often for dam developing to develop a clean source of energy. What, what, what would be your take on this, uh, on this kind of argument, especially in the context of Laos? Um, and more generally on Southeast Asia, have you ever heard um, any climate denialists um, arguments from that region, or is that 
more like a, a northern political strategy is facing. Mm. Thanks to two very interesting questions. Uh, I guess my answer to the first question might be a bit predictable that uh, the framing of uh, hydropower as clean energy is really a, um, just a convenience on behalf of those who would like to, uh, to build dams. Uh, there's a number of ways to approach this. One is to look at the literature on the climate uh, change impacts of dams themselves, that is the carbon emissions uh, from dams. And that's highly, I mean, it's still highly debated, uh, but it's also highly contingent, uh, specific uh, to what kind of dam, what configuration, how much forest it floods, uh, and therefore what kind of methane, methane emissions you get. Uh, there are also emissions just from the construct, construction materials and, uh, and so on. And there are well-known authors uh, like Philip Fearnside, who's worked particularly in South America, who, who claim that there are many dams whose uh, carbon emissions are larger over the long run uh, than would be uh, derived from a similar fossil fuel powered uh, power station. That's probably not the case for uh, most uh, large dams. So that's one, one way to get at the question. Um, but the other is uh, the, uh, the question of whether we see it as clean. And of course, clean depends on whether we're just talking about clean in terms of carbon or clean in terms of uh, other ways of thinking about environmental and social uh, impacts. So uh, from my experience of uh, working with dam affected communities and doing research over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, I've seen very little that's really clean about uh, dams. There's also not very much that's clean about the way in which knowledge is managed in the assessment of dams. There's more that's hidden than is revealed through the in, uh, environmental assessment process. Uh, so while I, you know, I won't take an absolutist stand against uh, uh, dams, a lot of the dams, certainly those on the mainstream of the Mekong River and many of those on the larger uh, tributaries uh, are causing immense, but I think uh, in today's world, even more importantly, unnecessary environmental harms when the economics of those dams, particularly if we look at the economics in terms of the full cost accounting of what they do to people's livelihoods, just don't make sense compared to the alternatives uh, that are there. And also compare, uh, when we consider them in terms of the surplus of energy that we have for the foreseeable future in, in the region. So that's one. The second question was about climate change denial. And no, there's not really um, the same. It's certainly not part of the political uh, scene here as it is in Trump's America or to a much lesser extent in Australia or uh, perhaps in some European countries even, even lesser uh, there. In fact, as I, you know, as I was trying to suggest in the latter part of my talk, there are cases where problems are explained away as climate change when they, as, as a kind of convenience. And it's almost simply out of ignorance or or generalization that it's, it's too easy to say, well, it's climate change, it's a kind of catch-all, uh, which is, you know, by, by no, that, is, that is of course by no means a climate denial argument in its own right to say that uh, climate change is used too often, but rather it's to say that things are more complicated than, uh, than that. And that if we, uh, one, of the, one of the difficulties I think in, in the region here is that uh, a lot of, the understanding of climate change impacts is stochastic, it's probability. So every storm that happens now could have happened before, uh, but they're happening more often and they have, you know, they're probably gonna happen uh, even, more, even more often. So there's a lot of modeling that goes on. And in, the, in terms of public discourse in all parts of the world, and certainly in Southeast Asia, it's quite difficult to uh, uh, put forward that, that, that as, a, as a kind of public uh, understanding. But, over, but overall, the short answer to your question is that uh, uh, I haven't really uh, seen it. If there is a denial, it's that uh, there's still push, a push to go ahead with coal-fired power stations. Indonesia is still one of, one of the world's largest exporters of coal and, uh, and Thailand and Vietnam have been trying to get uh, coal on the 
uh, on the agenda, which is not a denial of climate change in a way that would be, say, in Australia or, uh, or North America, uh, but it has to do with vested interests and, uh, and so on. Great. I think, well, that leads on to uh, nicely to the next question, that which uh, Ping Perea posed in the chat, which you can also access, Phil, but I'll, I'll just uh, read it out. So she's asking about the, the role of, um, of political culture in Southeast Asia and the, the specific role of corporations and regional organizations like ASEAN uh, in the political ecology of, of climate change. If you can say something about that. Yes, yeah, well, I mean, ASEAN has a, you know, has a climate change program, has an environmental program. Um, it doesn't wield a great deal of authority and there's certainly not an ASEAN-wide response to climate change. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, ASEAN doesn't really vote as a block at international uh, climate change meetings or uh, when it comes to uh, agreements, there is, you know, there is some sharing of knowledge and and, and position uh, there. But uh, if we look at the uh, political culture of ASEAN, uh, one thing you might be uh, referring to is the uh, so-called ASEAN way of, of non-interference. So, for example, if uh, Vietnam decided to go ahead with a coal-fired power station or even uh, as it's, as it's uh, suggested uh, at some points to go ahead with nuclear power, uh, it's unlikely that other countries in the region would challenge it directly, certainly not through ASEAN, because ASEAN is seen uh, as uh, respecting national sovereignty and, uh, and uh, dealing with issues by consensus rather than by, by, direct, uh, by direct challenge. Um, the polit political culture has certainly been very significant in uh, other environmental issues which are connected with climate change in some of the ways that I suggested in my talk. And uh, we're looking at uh, dams along transboundary rivers in particular, especially the Mekong, but also the uh, uh, Salawian uh, River. And there, the political culture of non-interference has led organizations like the Mekong River Commission uh, to be quite limited and timid, and some would say a paper tiger, uh, ineffective in terms of uh, really uh, dealing with projects uh, that countries may privately have concerns over that are not going to uh, challenge and don't have the uh, international legal authority to challenge uh, through such organizations based on this uh, political culture of consensus rather than uh, rather than uh, interference in what are seen in other countries' affairs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, just to the students who've been preparing for this lecture, uh, I know you've been thinking about questions you want to ask Professor uh, Hirsch. Um, just so you know, you're, you're meant to pose the questions yourselves, and uh, I'm not going to do it for you. Yeah? So. And uh, now is the time if, if someone wants to uh, yeah. ask the next question. Yeah, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I would la like to ask you um, about the impact of climate change when it comes to poverty in Southeast Asia. Yes, yeah. Well, climate change uh, impacts on the or just as so many other impacts of environmental uh, disasters impact on the poor disproportionately. The poor often live in vulnerable areas. Uh, they're uh, forced to live in flood prone areas, for example, in cities. We saw that in, in the case of uh, the floods in Bangkok, which as I said, are not, you know, were not attributable just to climate change, but uh, it's indicative that uh, those areas that are kept high and dry, for example, uh, let's, let's say, for example, uh, gated communities, housing estates where wealthier middle class uh, people live, are able to protect themselves by building flood protection. But the impact of that is to uh, 
create an even deeper flood in the areas that are outside such areas. So we can, we can see systemic area ways in which the poor may be put in more, more vulnerable circumstances. The poor tend to have uh, live in structures that are less robust, uh, that are, aren't as strong as uh, uh, those the wealthier uh, people. Uh, and uh, the poor are also more vulnerable to shocks. We're seeing this in a very different uh, set of shocks that's coming right at the moment, of course, with the pandemic, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we can see that, you know, strangely, in uh, mainland Southeast Asia, in the Mekong region, uh, most countries have had very little impact from the pandemic in public health terms, but have had, had enormous impact in, uh, uh, in economic uh, terms. And again, it's the poor who suffer the most because the shock intersects with the inability uh, to uh, survive through periods of hardship, the need to sell off land, sell off assets, to move away, uh, to borrow money and, and so on. So I think that if we're looking at the impact of climate change on poverty and on, uh, on the poor, we're seeing that the impact is often uh, somewhat indirect uh, because of the pre-existing vulnerability or what we sometimes call uh, precarity whether it's a shock such as COVID-19 or whether it's a shock such as uh, uh, climate change, uh, the poor uh, are usually in more, uh, more difficult circumstances. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Who wants to go next, or shall I read out a, a new question from the chat? Any of the students? Yeah, I, I can go next. It's actually my question from the chat. So thank you, Professor Hirsch. Um, do you have a feeling how high climate change ranks in public opinion uh, in um, Southeast Asia? Would it be a top three issue in the public mind, so to say? And are there regional or differences between the countries? Uh, interesting question. Uh, I, I'll tell you a quick, a quick story. I, I used to, when I was teaching at University of Sydney, I used to bring our student groups on field schools. We spend uh, a month, six weeks in the region. We, we spent a lot of time in local communities, talking to government officials and, and so on. This was some time ago, but uh, I remember at the end of uh, each field school, I'd ask students uh, you know, about their overall impressions. And what I heard from the Australian students was surprise that climate change was almost a non-issue. It hadn't been talked about as, 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 as an issue. So no, it's not in, in the top three from my experience. Um, that said, in, in recent years, people have become much more aware of climate change as an issue that's being discussed in, in the media. But in terms of people's priorities, it's not. It, 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 it simply hasn't uh, got the attraction that it has in Europe or Australia or uh, North America. Uh, that, that said, when, you know, when bad things happen, it's uh, people more and more are explaining weather events as uh, climate change. Sometimes as climate change through what they, you know, what children learn at school or what uh, adults read in the in newspapers or see on television or on social media or whatever, uh, but sometimes it's uh, climate change just in, as an experiential uh, phenomenon. People say, uh, I, have people, I have neighbors here who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, who earlier this year, when we had a very short but violent storm come through the neighborhood, uh, were saying they'd never seen anything like it in their lives. The weather's changing. So there's a, there is an experiential awareness of the phenomenon of climate change, uh, but it's not it's not the top three. No. Thank you. So there are several questions in the chat already. One is about the non-human subjects in the power relations related to the environment. Ah, yeah, so the critters, the uh, 
uh, animals. Uh, well, I, I, I guess probably the biggest global concern about uh, wildlife in Southeast Asia that's often associated with climate change are the victims of the huge fires in Indonesia and their impact on the orangutan uh, habitat. I don't know whether the questioner had that in mind, but that's, uh, that's something which is, uh, I suppose, globally, uh, because we have a flagship uh, species and, and really tragic uh, impacts there. But I think it's a very good example of where we need to be careful about trying to sort of separate out climate change per se, creating drier conditions, more fires from uh, other interests and uh, phenomena of development. And I'm thinking in particular, of course, of palm oil expansion and the conversion of areas of natural forest uh, to these huge monoculture uh, oil palm plantations. Uh, there are dramatic images you see on David Attenborough shows and so on of poor orangutans hugging a, the last remaining tree with uh, miles and miles of uh, barren land around them or burning land uh, around them. So, so certainly there's been, you know, there, there, there are impacts uh, there. But the extent to which that's a phenomenon of climate change and the extent to which it's part of the politics or political economy of agricultural and agribusiness development in the region is where the controversy lies, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd suggest. Thank you. Okay, let's have another oral intervention. You can also make a point, you know, probably lots of people who know uh, the region and the issues. Do you agree with everything that uh, Professor Hirsch has been saying, or do you want to contradict him? Yeah, please disagree with me. <laughs> yeah. Let's have some controversy, right? Yes. What's all about? <laughs> some of the students. Uh, I have another question. Is it possible to get the big companies to take action against the climate change? <laughs> mm. Yeah, so that's a, <laughs> so a question. Well, I suppose it depends on what you know, what sort of companies and what sort of actions you're you're looking at, uh, Diana. It's uh, in, in, in Thailand, for example, uh, large corporations, particularly the very large monopoly, monopolistic corporations that are very, very wealthy, belong to just a few Sino Thai families, are uh, into CSR, corporate social responsibility. But the idea of CSR in Thailand is not really taking re about taking responsibility for the actions associated with the main uh, economic function of the corporation itself. It's about giving something back to community development here, to digging a well there, to uh, donating blankets in times of uh, floods uh, somewhere, somewhere else. And so uh, if you're asking our, our companies that, for example, oil palm companies, are they going to uh, take responsibility by reducing the burning of natural uh, forests? I doubt it. They might, uh, uh, they might build a mosque or a, uh, or a church somewhere, but that's more likely uh, in terms of the corporate culture of social responsibility uh, within the region. There's another level which is relevant to your question, uh, which is whether uh, companies based in Europe or North America or Australia are going to take some responsibility for their, uh, their emissions. And unfortunately, I think we tend to see that happening uh, mostly through the kinds of schemes like the Red Plus scheme or the uh, Climate Development Mechanism scheme that I talked about, 
uh, where it's a kind of offloading of responsibility. It means paying some money, but it also is a kind of buying a license to continue to pollute. You'll hear a lot more about that from some of the other speakers in this series. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Professor Hirsch. Um, I would like to know, um, you, you spoke about all this flooding. And um, so I think people, um, especially poor people, will deeply uh, be um, um, affected by um, the climate change phenomenon. And um, do you think if we, if we go back to 1986 in the Philippines with this so-called people power revolution, do you think that people, when they, they have to migrate from, from their um, own places because the places are flooded, that that will put some certain pressure on the, on the um, uh, regimes? And that um, there will be other um, revolutions like that because people will think, hey, we need a solution and the regimes, the government are doing nothing about it. Yeah, I mean, there's in, certainly been a very active uh, environmental politics movement in, in the region. It tends to be associated with uh, actions and impacts that are very directly attributable to uh, bad government performance or to, sometimes to bad corporate uh, uh, performance. Climate change is a difficult one uh, in, that, in that respect to generate that kind of politics uh, because it tends to be distanced. It tends to be seen as something caused uh, somewhere else. So, and there are also many uh, reasons why people show dissatisfaction with their government. I don't know whether you've been reading uh, in the papers about what's going on in Thailand at the moment, but uh, the young people in particular have been out on the streets in a way and talking about issues uh, that are really quite unprecedented in, uh, in uh, Thailand. Uh, they're interestingly also closely connected with your own country, with Germany and the presence of the Thai monarch in Germany. So uh, you may want to go and <laughs> read up a bit about that, but, uh, but they're, not, they're not linked in any sense or form with climate change, no. And again, if we go back to the People's Power Revolution in the 1960s against, this is sorry, 1980s against Marcos, uh, again, that had really uh, nothing to do with climate change or even environment at that point, even though there was an environmental politics movement uh, emerging at that time, particularly against uh, uh, illegal uh, forestry. Uh, that was, it was maybe a small part of the, uh, the mix, but it wasn't essentially an environmental revolt. Great, thank you. We have another question in the chat um, from Parrot, whether religious organizations could be a um, a coalition partner for climate justice struggles. Um, he's sharing the example of uh, Muhammadiyah in Indonesia, where they uh, are playing a, a role for ecological or environmental regulation. Um, do you see similar tendencies in other countries in Southeast Asia? Certainly, yeah. in the Philippines, the Catholic Church, the Jesuits in Thailand, uh, they have been very progressive. Buddhist monks who've been uh, involved in uh, various environmental, uh, showing environmental uh, concern. One practice, just for example, is the idea of ordaining trees, putting saffron robes around uh, trees as a way of, uh, of protecting them. Um, but these are mostly uh, actions at a, at a community level, at a quite a local level. Uh, I haven't seen much or really any engagement uh, with, with climate change questions. They tend to be around uh, the many, many environmental issues that are uh, more, uh, that are closer to home and more tangible uh, for uh, people in, in those communities. At a, at a, at a, maybe at a, at a, I mean, when you hear, you do hear more and more, uh, for example, indigenous uh, leaders in, 
in Thailand from ethnic uh, minorities, particularly in the upland of northern Thailand, uh, who have become involved in international uh, networks uh, and who use uh, spiritual arguments and, 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 and uh, uh, ideas uh, to talk about the need to protect not only their own uh, village or forest, or, but to protect the earth. And so in quite general terms, uh, you can see a kind of coming together of, of planetary concern about uh, the way we've been developing and the way in which uh, indigenous or cultural minorities <coughs> have, uh, have framed their, uh, their arguments and their, 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 their concerns about the path of development. But it's still quite a, it's quite a abstract and unfocused uh, level of concern. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for responding, sir. Uh, you know, um, nicely to all these questions that they keep coming. Any anyone else? We have uh, maybe time for one or two last questions or comments. There's one question in the chat that I'm keeping till the end. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, can I comment on Professor Hughes' uh, point on uh, I think the issue, I think there was a question whether uh, climate change is a priority issue among the people and then he said something that it's not. But I'd like to make a different view, no? speaking as a, I'm a Filipino, I'm based in the Philippines. Uh, staying up late for this <laughs> it's an interesting topic for me but it's because of the culture of the people that they have been used to to these kinds of typhoons they're used to it huh? like we just had the, the typhoon uh, three days ago so it's not that it's not a priority but they have internalized it so they have a way of coping with it that it, it, when you ask them what's your immediate problem, the, the immediate problem is basically the livelihood, what was the food at the table, because they have learned how to cope with this, with this uh, impacts of climate change, and I think that also goes to the my point earlier on the political culture that the people are generally unquestioning. I'm not saying that they are submissive. Because there are groups that are really uh, also, you know, uh, activists and and you know uh, mobilizing against the government. But the overall uh, culture, no, and and I've worked in Southeast Asia uh, for for almost two decades now, and I've seen the, the rural people from almost all ASEAN member states. There's this, uh, I don't know, maybe the word, maybe it's not accurate, no. Uh, but it's this culture of submissiveness to someone in authority. So somehow it's difficult really for people, for, for an issue such as environment or climate change to be a politically uh, mobilizing issue. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Mm. Would you like me to respond? Uh... Oliver? Yes, please do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thanks. I, I, I take it as a comment, and I, 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 I actually, yeah, yeah. I, well, you don't have uh, to comment. No, 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 it's 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 good to have some controversy too. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, 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 but I, don't, I don't think we really fundamentally uh, disagree, except that I, you know, in some cases people are submissive, but in, in other, other cases people are are active, but sometimes in in clever ways that are not directly confrontational, but uh, yeah, maybe the that's challenge the in the challenge in other in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of James Scott's weapons of the week and the way in which people mm -hmm. uh, uh, manage. But with but with climate change, I mean, I'm interested that uh, you use the example of the current uh, typhoon and this. I mean, it's really really tough situation of one after the other that people in the Philippines and also in Vietnam uh, are facing. I wonder to what extent people explain those in terms of climate change. Uh, and if they do, you know, is there a, 
is there a kind of blame that people put on uh, particular countries or activities, uh, or is it simply seen as a kind of act of God or, or, or nature that is simply misfortune and, and the blame then goes to the government for not responding well enough rather than uh, whoever causes the uh, typhoon in the first place. Mm -hmm. You want me to respond also? <laughs> sure, I'd, I'd be, be nice to hear you. Okay. To hear. Oh, no, if, yeah. if our uh, host will allow me. Yes, uh, I think you're right that the people are always really accepting no? of, of, of this situation that they, they don't really uh, blame, you know, countries from, from you know, the, the Annex One countries. Because we've done that, no? I worked with NGOs before to, to really drive home the issue that this is actually, you know, uh, the, the, the origins of this are from, you know, the, the industrialized countries. But from the people's lived experience, they, they really cannot relate to it. And perhaps their, their basic concern really is how they will respond. And perhaps governments will have a problem if, as what you said, if they, they are uh, inept in their response, and that's where they have some trouble. But actually, that's how also politicians have mastered the game you know, of, uh, of mobilizing disaster relief. They plaster their faces and their names in the relief goods being distributed, even from other, even the Yolanda relief uh, goods from, 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 from that period. Uh, most of them were, were ended up in the politicians' uh, homes and they distributed by their uh, lieutenants. No? So there's a, there's a big role really of, of the local networks of the local bosses on this. So that's mm. my response. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks for a lot. Um, it's, it's good to have different uh, opinions, and I'm sure we'll be discussing this point about, you know, why do movements around climate change emerge and why don't they um, as, as the series goes on. Um, it hasn't been a, you know, great, I mean, a general phenomenon in Europe until the Fridays for Future movement uh, hit the streets. So, um, I think there's a lot, lot more to be said about that, but we'll we'll save that for the uh, later lectures. Uh, I'd like to give uh, Phil the opportunity to to wrap up um, and just insert one last question from the chat about um, the impact of the COVID uh, nineteen pandemic on responses to climate change. So, is it going to make societies come together more and then respond perhaps more? collectively or effectively against climate change or is it going to be an excuse to you know uh, prioritize economic growth uh, above all else to get out of the you know the the economic uh, crisis that the pandemic is, is creating so what what's your mm. perspective on that so you're leaving you're leaving the easy question to last are you? <laughs> um, so well of course that's a huge uh, a huge uh, a question a very very interesting one in fact right now i'm working on on some uh on closely related issues to this i mean this is a global question are we going to build build back better or build back faster and there are i think there are mixed uh uh, signals there. There were some studies done very early on in March and April, uh, looking at the reduced emissions in, in China and India, but to some extent also in parts of Southeast Asia, uh, which showed very significant uh, reductions in emissions and also in, in pollution. You could see the Himalayas from parts of Northern India that you, you used to not be able to see before. Uh, but this was, of course, because of a complete shutdown in economic activity, so it's quite temporary. And the question is whether uh, things are going to then just go back to the way they were uh, before or whether some lessons will be uh, learned. I mean, there are some worrying signs, as, uh, for example, the so-called omnibus law in Indonesia suggests that uh, some countries are looking to uh, get their economies going by taking shortcuts, environmental shortcuts, uh, reducing the amount of time needed for environmental assessment. Uh, in India, uh, President Modi has uh, similarly indicated that they're going to try to get out of the economic crisis that the pandemic has brought by uh, making the world safer for, for big business. Uh, so in that sense, it's not very 
uh, not very promising. Uh, but uh, then again, it also, I think, depends a lot on the trajectory of not only the health side of the pandemic, but also on what that means to movement of people and 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 goods and 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 investment and and, and so on. But it may be that the uh, sort of breakneck pace of uh, of, of of growth and uh, and movement may uh, may slow down uh, some somewhat. Uh, what that does then for the footprint of the region in terms of global climate change is a is another question and and also the uh, what it does to the uh, resources available for investment in clean you know in clean energy safe places to live uh, uh, resilient housing and so on that's another uh, set of questions so I it's a good question, but with some very complex answers, I think, and 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 and, and many unknowns. Great. Is there anything else you want to add, Phil, to to finish? No, just thank. Exactly? Not really. Just just thanks for the uh, for the opportunity, and I look forward to uh, sitting in on at least some of the uh, the future ones. Uh, uh, thank you very much, to the students, for your uh, questions. Keep on. Uh, thinking about uh, provocative questions to put to the uh, future uh, panelists. And if maybe there's one thing to leave you with, it's as you listen to the series, you know, based in a, a country in Europe that now has a very high awareness of climate change, has taken measures, but where you also have a, a kind of domestic politics around climate change, uh, think about how this global phenomenon actually plays out quite differently in, in, in different places and what, and, and what that means. I think that'll make the whole series uh, even more interesting if you can sort of bring it back, as some of your questions already have been doing to uh, the situation in, in, in Germany and in Europe uh, more, more generally. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, we can uh, thank, no, really thanks a lot, Phil. That was a great uh, introduction to the whole series again. Um, and especially appreciated that you stayed up so late to talk to us. So have a good night, good night's sleep. Uh, we just want to um, uh, show the next um, lecture next week. Um, is Manuel Hipke there to introduce it? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I can introduce you for next week, uh, for our next lecture. So uh, again, thank you very much, Mr. Hirsch, uh, for your lecture today. It was very interesting and very good. Um, next week, we will have another very interesting lecture, uh, which is called the Mekong Delta Under Threat by Professor Dr. Li Antoine from the Canto University uh, in Southern uh, Vietnam. And um, he will speak um, about the specific topic uh, about how the climate change affects um, everything in the Mekong Delta. And today we had like a basic overview of Southeast Asia. And next week we'll go a little bit deeper into a specific area um, in the Mekong Delta. And um, I think it will be a very interesting lecture where we can learn um, how this uh, big topic affects a kind of small area uh, in Vietnam, and I'm very interested uh, in this topic. And I hope that we will uh, see each other again next week um, to our next lecture with uh, Professor Dr. Lee Antoine. Yes. Great. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Um, there was one question in the chat. How, uh, how can we decolonialize the debate around climate change and climate politics? And I think um, I do hope that we, with this uh, lecture series, we are contributing to the decolonialization of the, the, this, the, the debate by bringing people in Germany together with some of the leading activists and um, academics from Southeast Asia. Um, so I'm looking forward to the, the next lecture, and I hope you are too. Um, if um, the point that Phil made about connecting it to the situation in Germany, I think is a very important one. So if someone from Fridays for Future is here and would like to 
Um, you know, let us know if there's anything planned, any meetings you're planning or actions that you'd like to invite the participants to, to join. Now is your chance. Seems like not so spontaneously, but I think that might happen as the lecture series goes on. So um, thank you everyone for joining and see you all next week. Mm -hmm.